Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lever Time. I'm David Sirota. On today's show, why do polls show a majority of Americans support a ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict, and yet only 18 members of the U.S. House are officially supporting a resolution calling for such a ceasefire? What explains that huge gap between what the public wants and what Congress wants? Part of the answer has to do with how America's political discourse has been deliberately polarized by conservative groups seeking to equate support for Israel's fundamental right to exist with support for the specific policies of Israel's current right-wing government. We discussed that discourse manipulation with Wisconsin Democratic Congressman Mark Pocan, who's been calling for a ceasefire and who recently tangled with the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee over its role polarizing the discourse and demonizing Democrats who dare to question the policies of Benjamin Netanyahu's government. For our paid subscribers, we're also always dropping bonus episodes into our Lever Premium podcast feed. Last week, we published our episode about the online music platform Bandcamp, which was recently sold to the licensing company SongTrader. If you're curious about how corporate influence affects the way you listen to music, make sure to check it out. In fact, we took the paywall down for that episode, so our listeners can also find it in the regular Lever Time feed from earlier this week. But if you want regular access to our premium content, head over to levernews.com and click the subscribe button in the top right to become a supporting subscriber. That'll give you access to the Lever Premium podcast feed, exclusive live events, even more in-depth reporting, and you'll be directly supporting the investigative journalism that we do here at The Lever. Okay, we're going to get to my interview with Congressman Mark Pocan. But first, a little background on what's been happening in Congress with regard to the ongoing crisis in Israel and Gaza. As of the time of this recording, the Israeli government's overwhelming bombing campaign of the Gaza Strip has reportedly killed over 9,000 Palestinians, including over 3,500 children. Eighteen House members have signed on to a ceasefire resolution, which calls for a pause in the bombing, calls for allowing time for humanitarian aid to enter Gaza, and calls for continued negotiations between the Israeli government and Hamas, the terrorist group that mass-murdered 1,400 Israeli civilians and that's holding roughly 200 Israeli citizens hostage. The few members of Congress who have been critical of the Israeli government's response to Hamas's disgusting terrorist attack, they have received massive pushback from the media, other elected officials, and most aggressively by AIPAC, the conservative lobbying group that portrays itself as the leading so-called pro-Israel lobbying group. AIPAC depicts unquestioning support for Benjamin Netanyahu's policies as effectively the only pro-Israel position. I happen to dispute that. I believe Netanyahu's inhumane and out-of-control policies are not only immoral, but actively endangering Israel's security and its survival. But in Washington, the AIPAC view dominates. And that's because it spends a lot of money on politics, as does the super PAC, Democratic Majority for Israel, or DMFI. Together, they spend big money on elections, demonizing candidates and lawmakers who dare to push for things like a two-state solution, peace in the region, and anything that deviates from Netanyahuism. So today, I was joined by Democratic Congressman Mark Pocan from Wisconsin, who found himself in a dispute with AIPAC because he criticized how that group raises money from Republican donors, which is then spent in Democratic primaries. We also discussed the House's ceasefire resolution, his thoughts on the Biden administration's response to the crisis in Israel and Palestine, and most importantly, how to frame a critical response of the Israeli government without alienating the people you're trying to convince. Congressman Pocan, thanks so much for taking time with us. Oh, glad to be here, David. Thank you. Um, so th- let's first talk about the the ceasefire resolution uh, in in the House of Representatives. I-, I read this resolution. It seemed like the most minimal statement that should be able to be made by literally everybody in Congress. And yet it only has, as of right now, 18 House members who have signed on to it. So I guess my question is, first, tell us what the resolution is, how you interpret it, 
And then tell us why so few members of Congress seem willing to sign on to it. Sure. I, many more members have made statements of either stop the bombing, cessation of hostilities, or actually use the word ceasefire. Um, but uh, last time I looked, the speaker we have is a religious ideologue from Louisiana, uh, and there's a Republican majority, and the resolution is bluntly going nowhere. And while the groups have said they wanted a tool to organize around, not everyone, you know, when something is needed as immediate as this, this is not seen as an answer. I think that's probably the main reason. Secondly, even though in the common vernacular, um, ceasefire, stop the bombing, cessation of hostilities are the same thing, officially, uh, a ceasefire process at some point sets it up to stop bombing, but that could be two weeks, two months down the road. And what people really need is an immediate stopping of the bombing is, you know, 3,000 plus kids now and 8,000 plus people are dead in Gaza. So I just think it was a idea that uh, wasn't as probably good as it could have been for the urgency we had. Um, you know, the first week we did get a letter out uh, that we worked with UNRWA, quite honestly, on to talk about some things to the president. We got 55 people to sign on. The next thing we did needed to build from that, right? We had to continue to show. And I think this as a vehicle, as an, as a vehicle that is kind of meaningless because the pressure has to be on the White House. Congress under Mike Johnson is not going to be doing anything useful on this. I think that was probably the main reason why you see as few sponsors on it as you do. What have you heard, if anything, from the White House about uh, the president and uh, the Pentagon, the State Department, using all of its influence, uh, its diplomatic influence uh, and the like, to pressure Israel to dial back what it's doing, dial back and halt uh, the bombardment of uh, Gaza. I mean, are they saying if we do that, then it will somehow undermine Israel's security? Or are they saying nothing? Like, what's what, if any, feedback have you gotten? Yeah. So, and first of all, what you're saying now is the exact thing we should be doing. The pressure has to be on the White House because the only way you're going to impact what's happening is through the White House pressuring Israel. Um, so, whatever we do, and we are looking right now at doing something, trying to get above that 55 number, but still gets us to the process, perhaps, of a ceasefire with an immediate way to stop the bombing. So a number of us are actually working on a letter or a statement. We're trying to figure that out in the very immediate future to do just that. Um, but the pressure has to be on the White House, and that is where it can be impacted. Now, I know that in the past, when there were some bombings a number of years ago, a number of us were on a call, um, Ilhan, myself, uh, Jamal, uh, I think Pramila and a few others, what they told us was uh, when they were doing the legal settlements, uh, and that was part of obviously the reason for the, the reaction um, that they were seeing, that they had told them no unilateral unprovoked actions. That was the official policy, right? So no more illegal settlements. Um, but they do that. They do it in a quiet diplomatic way. I think the president doesn't wear his foreign policy on his sleeve in that way. So one, I can't tell you exactly what they're saying. I wish I did, but part of it is we have tried to put pressure to say, look, like 20 trucks of humanitarian aid in a day compared to 500 that normally would come into Gaza is clearly ridiculous for 2.3 million people, right? And we're trying to put the pressure on in that way, but we need to, as Congress, that is the single most important thing we can do. Um, nothing is gonna come out of the US House of Representatives uh, with a Republican speaker that's going to be useful. But the pressure that's needed has to come from the White House. And, you know, honestly, the groups we all missed uh, a couple weeks ago, not we all, because some of us were working on it, um, the, the supplemental that was coming, that's the only funding for a year. And we were trying to get far more humanitarian aid. We could have used some support on that, but everyone was kind of focused on the resolution, which had they talked to us, we would have had them walk and chew gum because at least walking would move forward. Chewing gum alone wasn't, you know, the answer. And we didn't have a lot of support. And, you know, to Barbara Lee's credit, to be blunt, she and I were on the phone until about 9.45 Thursday night with the White House. She got about an extra billion dollars um, included from where they were going. But we would have liked billions more to really do the job that's going to be needed to not just rebuild Gaza, but for humanitarian aid, period. So, again, I think whatever pressure we do, we do need to have the White House um, doing 
whether they do it in their normal back channel way uh, or other way, I'm not going to necessarily tell them because I think it's harder to change the president on years and years of practice. But they need to know that Congress cares and we need to have a sign from Congress that we're above the 55 mark, not at an 18 mark, right? And I think we're working on a vehicle to do that right now. Now, there was this recent resolution in the House that passed overwhelmingly with only 10 no's, a, a resolution described as standing with Israel as it defends itself against the barbaric war launched by Hamas uh, and, and other terrorist groups. There was, I guess, among the 10 who voted against it, uh, there was, I guess, uh, what I inferred from that was they were opposed to a one-sided statement. Um, what do you make of that resolution? What were the Republicans trying to do? I don't think they, they're they not usually acting in, in good faith. You did vote for this, but some of your uh, Progressive Caucus colleagues mm -hmm. voted against it. Just your, your thoughts on that resolution, why some folks voted against it, why it passed overwhelmingly and the like. Yeah, when it was introduced, it would have been the time to pass it, but the Republicans couldn't select a speaker and we couldn't do any process. So, you know, um, at the time it was valid and it still is that, you know, Hamas is a terrorist organization that did a horrific attack. And I think that's essentially the essence of it. Um, we often get into this conversation about, well, the numbers have changed. You know, more people now have died here since that was written. And yes, and that's one of the problems with putting specific numbers in a resolution, which quite honestly is the same problem with the resolution that's out there right now asking for a ceasefire. It has numbers that were weeks old. That was probably the main objection, I think, if people would have liked to have shown the totality of what happened. But it was a statement by the United States condemning Hamas for the horrific attack, which it was. And that's all it was, really. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes, you know, trying to get the language perfect when it's already written and it was written at a certain time that had it passed would have been probably more significant than when it ultimately did, had more to do with our chaotic uh, functioning of the Republican majority. So I want to I want to go a little further on, on this question about Hamas and Israel. Um, mm -hmm. Since Israel's bombing has begun, uh, and, and I have I have supported a ceasefire. I think we need a ceasefire immediately. I just want to make, make clear for all the listeners who are listening to this. I am people who've listened to this. They they know that. But I think there has been a, a, a kind of slide among some into saying Israel's bombardment is unacceptable. The occupation must end. There needs to be a ceasefire. There needs to at least be a humanitarian pause into Hamas is a uh, legitimate armed resistance uh, to what Israel is doing. And you've seen that kind of theme bubble up a little bit. Now, I I reject that. I, I find that odious. I find that disgusting. I find Hamas is not legitimate. I, I, I It is a terrorist organization in the classic sense of the word. But there are folks who, who I, I think there's this perception that any criticism of Hamas somehow means that you're supporting everything that the Israeli government uh, is doing uh, subsequent to the Hamas uh, attack. What do you say to folks who would say that Hamas represents and what it has done is a legitimate form of armed resistance to Israel's wrongheaded and unacceptable occupation? Yeah, so I, I think any attack where you um, go after innocence, uh, specifically children and babies, uh, where you uh, go into a music festival and randomly kill non-combatants um, is seen as a horrific attack. So I think, you know, the way I describe it is clearly there's a horrific attack by a terrorist organization, Hamas, onto Israel, and Israel has a right to go after the terrorist organization where the difference is, and the difference is really based on fact, I think you and I would agree, that uh, clearly every person in Gaza, 2.3 million people, is not Hamas. I mean, Hamas Agreed. was about 1,000 people that day. And the collective punishment of what we're seeing, that is really the only way you can describe it. When you take out a quarter of the buildings in northern Gaza, and we've seen the pictures and the video of that, uh, or when you've got 8,000 dead, including 3,100 uh, children, and those are several day old, so I know that number is higher, uh, now, um, clearly is not a targeted attack uh, after Hamas. Uh, you are doing a, a broader punishment. And the fact that we've seen leaked some plans that say you take everyone out of Gaza and put them in the Sinai, like, 
you know, clearly um, there is a lot more going on here, and that is why uh, the calls to stop uh, hostilities against civilians immediately, honestly, probably has 50 or 60 people have said that in some form here. And we would be wiser to collect all those statements and, again, from a position of strength, use that um, because I think more people do believe that. That was the initial kind of support we had that first week, and then we found a way to kind of fumble it a little bit, and now we're trying to get it back up again to show um, that that is a concern. But, you know, when you talk to many members, they get it. Now, I, I've talked to other members who will just outright say, you know, there are casualties in war, and I think it's an absolutely ridiculous, asinine argument back um, because, you know, these are clearly innocent kids are not Hamas, and there's absolutely zero justification for what's happening. Um, but, you know, they're now hitting refugee camps, and they're using the same old uh, line that, oh, you know, Hamas uses human shields. Well, no. If you supposedly have one of the most sophisticated intelligence uh, entities on the planet like Israel uh, supposedly has, uh, you can be more specific in actually attacking Hamas without doing what they're doing, the amount of damage, uh, both in human lives and physical structures. So, um, you know, I just talked about it very simply. It was a horrific attack by Hamas. Israel has a right to respond to Hamas. They have uh, over gone. Uh, they've, they've done more than that. It's become collective punishment. Uh, we need to stop the bombing of civilians, period. Uh, that includes from Hamas and Islamic Jihad as well as uh, from the Israelis. And I, we want to see a plan because I don't think they've shown the United States a plan. And, you know, I also describe it, and this is not some people's favorite description, but, you know, if, if Israel is an ally, which they are of the United States, you know, if you go to a bar and a friend gets drunk, you may not tell the person at the end of the bar they shouldn't drive because you don't know the person and why would they listen to you, but you tell your friend that. And right now, uh, what Israel's doing, in my opinion, is clearly wrong, and we have a moral obligation, especially as we're supplying them with weapons, uh, to you know make sure that they stop this. And that should be the minimum request. More humanitarian supply uh, has to uh, clearly uh, get into the country. There has to be corridors for people to be able to leave. You can't tell people they got to go to the south and then bomb the south. You can't bomb refugee camps. Like, we've got to really put the moral argument that I think is behind the United States behind uh, what's happening right now. And, and at least people aren't seeing that. And if it is happening behind the scenes, I do think it would be helpful to, to say that more publicly by the White House. I mean, I think what Israel's doing, there's a trifecta of, of bad here. I mean, it is, first and foremost, it is... It, it, it has gone beyond self-defense into the immoral. It is collective punishment. It is unacceptable and immoral. Yeah, I think it, frankly, endangers Israel, and I believe that Israel does have a right to exist. I want to state that clearly. I know there's some on the left who don't think Israel even has a fundamental right to exist uh, in the 1948 or 1967 borders. I believe Israel has a fundamental right to exist. And I think this policy, on top of being immoral, endangers Israel's survival. And I also think it endangers Jews across the world because I think that uh, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, but anti-Zionism often uh, prompts anti-Semitism. Uh, and I think that what this has done uh, has, is endangering Jews across the world. And I, I am Jewish, so I am personally concerned about that for my community as well. I want to turn to the other side of, of, of the discourse. Can I say one quick thing, though, sure. David? Go ahead. If I could. And thank you for raising that point, because that is something we are talking about as well, um, that by doing what they're doing, you are more likely to have Hezbollah and others get involved. And long term, this is a failed strategy. If you're a kid who's only grown up in an open air prison because Israel controls who goes in and out of Gaza and is constantly bombed, and then this happens and they've lost family members in their home, do you think they're going to become peace activists uh, or do you think they're likely to turn to a group like Hamas? So I actually think their strategy, that's why we need a strategy from them. I don't think I see a strategy from Israel unless it is just, you know, turning Gaza into a parking lot and trying to do a start over, which would be unacceptable on many levels. So I'm glad you said that because we are talking about that as well as a significant factor. Yes. And to be clear, I think that the conditions that Israel uh, has create, helped create with the occupation and is helping create now with this bombardment makes the blowback 
inevitable. It doesn't mean Hamas's blowback is justified. And that's a key distinction. In, right. Inevitability is different than yeah. justified. Uh, and so I agree with you. I think it's endangering Israel. I think it's endangering Jews across the world. So let's turn to the other side of the debate, because this, this is really important here. APAC, the American Public Affairs Council, um, uh, DMFI, the, uh, the pro-Israel group that has spent in Democratic primaries, a uh, lot of Republican money spending in Democratic primaries. And the message from that side of – and I, I'm putting it, quote, pro-Israel in quotes, because I don't believe APAC's position and DMFI's position is the solely, quote, pro-Israel position. But that's their brand. And they make the argument that the only uh, thing that anybody who uh, supports the existence of the state of Israel uh, should be doing is supporting whatever the Netanyahu government does. Uh, and, and they've spent a lot of money uh, on elections uh, to, to, I think, scare Democratic members of Congress into not piping up. Uh, not saying uh, something different, not advocating for a two state solution, not advocating for a ceasefire. How powerful is APAC and DMFI in um, keeping your Democratic colleagues quiet for fear that they're the next ones to be targeted in a Democratic primary by that money? Yeah. So DMFI is is trying to desperately become the little sister of APAC, uh, but they're not doing so well. I don't think they're as significant. APAC clearly is the, you know, for uh, overused uh, saying, an 800 pound gorilla sort of in that that realm. Um, and clearly uh, what we saw in the last election uh, was they had a huge impact, right? They put in millions and millions of dollars from largely Republican donors and then spent it in Democratic primaries. Um, and I think, you know, what many of us have seen and, and we're trying to call out right now is, you know, I feel like they are a wholly owned subsidiary, really, of the Republican Party and of the conservative movement that happens to use Israel as one of the issues that they care about. Um, but they are very much um, there to support Republicans. And we, no, we look no further than over 100 insurrectionists were supported for re-election by AIPAC. So, you know, they're, they're so against terrorism, except maybe when it happens in our country, um, because they supported 100 of those folks. And, you know, as someone who's an out gay man, I think they should just come out as a conservative Republican organization because you can live freer uh, by being true to yourself rather than playing this game um, that they are. And they need to be called out because I think some of the stuff they're doing um, is not just really, you know, on behalf of the conservative movement and, and Netanyahu in particular when it comes to uh, Israeli issues, uh, but I find much of it, um, you know, borderline sexist, racist, uh, you know, they're really going after certain specific members. I think the only reason I've been um, included in their attacks lately is because I'm a white man and they wanted to not just be seen as going after people of color. And I think somehow I got in there. And also I've been very vocal on them and they brought me into the fight, honestly, because I hadn't been saying a whole lot lately. I've always, you know, kind of went after APAC and called them out for what they are. But now I'm more than glad to continue to do that. If they want to have the fight, I'm I'm here. Um, but, you know, we need to call them out for what they're doing. And really, um, it is nothing more than standing up for the Republican Party, the conservative candidates. The proof is in supporting over 100 insurrectionists. And then they take Republican money and spend it in Democratic primaries to try to find someone who will be closest to their values, knowing that their values really are of being a conservative organization overall, not just specifically a front for Netanyahu's positions. I mean, look, the pro-Israel, quote unquote, this pro-Israel side of the, of the discourse targeted for, for, for electoral elimination, Andy Levin, a Jewish Democrat, in Michigan, right. an incumbent, yes. uh, you know, in a redistricting fight, they targeted him because he had pushed for a two state solution and didn't express the line that the only way to be uh, f to support the existence, the fundamental existence of the state of Israel is to support uh, the particular Israeli government that's in power right now. And and, and so I, I think that's a good place to end this 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 conversation, which is to ask you this. 
I get concerned sometimes that people will hear a criticism of APAC or DMFI, a righteous criticism, a criticism that I believe in, uh, that they will hear that as uh, – and they will hear terms like the Jewish lobby as – and interpret it as – all Jews are to blame for this, that, that to go back to the old tropes, Jews are just a powerful cabal uh, and that the Jewish community is one monolith. I guess the question that I, that's on my mind a lot is how do we make these arguments in ways, uh, these righteous arguments in ways that don't risk or at least mitigate against evoking that kind of much uglier anti-Semitism uh, that can be flown under the banner of social justice. I, I think there's a tension there, and I just want to know how you as a congressman navigate that. Yeah, and, and David, you bring up a good point, because I read uh, too, probably too many social uh, media comments, and a lot of people wind up going into that, and it's kind of a trap, right? It's, it's, it's not the issue. It's not um, The issue is you have a group like APAC that is a Trojan horse for the, the conservative movement and really the Republican Party by extension, um, doing what they're doing. And um, that is not uh, something that's because it's a pro-Israel position. It's a pro-Netanyahu position, um, but it's not a pro-Israel position. I mean, you know, we, I, I completely agree with you. We should be able to support the right for both Israel and Palestine to have a state, the two-state solution that I still think is the best path forward. And you could support both. In fact, when I've been in the region, and I've been there three times, um, on the ground, I see more real people, both Israelis uh, and um, Palestinians, who, who believe that. It's often those governmental leaders, and Netanyahu in particular. Don't forget, if he's not in power, he may be in jail, right? He's got mm -hmm. extra incentives to try to stay uh, in his job. Um, but these other groups are not about the support of, of the Jewish population. They're about playing in, into conservative politics, Trojan horsing, using that as an issue, and they need to be called out for that. I appreciate you calling calling it out. I appreciate other members calling it out. And by the way, I want to be clear. I appreciate you calling it out in a way that is precise and that, that makes clear that, that those set of groups that are doing this are not representative of the Jewish religion and not representative of the Jewish community writ large. There is something much deeper, much more nefarious going on here. And I really, really just want to appreciate say yes. that I, 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 have, I have gratitude for you explicitly calling it out. It needs to be called out even more. It's doing a disservice to, to the, frankly, to the existence of the state of Israel, to the Jewish community, uh, and to the, most importantly, in the here and now, to stopping uh, the the killing of of thousands of civilians uh, in Palestine. Congressman Mark Pocan, thank you so much for your time today. Sure. David, thank you as always. Appreciate it. That's it for today's show. As a reminder, our paid subscribers who get Lever Time Premium, you get to hear next week's bonus episode, our episode about the recent sale of the online music platform Bandcamp. To listen to Lever Time Premium, just head over to levernews.com to become a supporting subscriber. When you do, you get access to all of the Lever's premium content, including our weekly newsletters and our live events. And that's all for just eight bucks a month or 70 bucks for the year. One last favor. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and write a review for Lever Time on your favorite podcast app. The app you are listening to right now, take 10 seconds and give us a positive review in that app. And make sure to check out all of the incredible reporting our team has been doing over at levernews.com. Until next time, I'm David Sirota. Rock the boat. The Lever Time Podcast is a production of The Lever and The Lever Podcast Network. It's hosted by me, David Sirota. Our producer is Frank Capello with help from Lever producer Jared Jacang-Mayer.